Hello, everyone. Uh, once you've settled in, we have Peter Eckersley um, on his talk about com the complex ethics of piracy. Um, we will have time for questions. We have a microphone in the middle of the uh, audience, so please use this when asking questions. And please uh, use the microphone and signal us if you have questions. Don't disrupt the talk as seen before. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I should check the sound. Can you all hear me clearly? No. OK. Let's see what we can do about this. How about now? OK, this is, this is, this is going to fall down, so I'm going to try and hold it up. And uh, any time uh, that you can't hear me clearly, just put your hand up, and I'll know what's going on. Uh, so my background, I did research, uh, like doctoral research, on digital copyright policy. These days, I work for the Electronic Frontier Foundation in San Francisco. But this talk should not in any way be taken to reflect the opinions of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. It's my own research and my own opinions. And the, 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 the subject I'm going to be talking about is the ethics or otherwise of piracy. And I think this is a complicated subject that hasn't received nearly enough attention. So I want to answer a question, which is whether people should ever engage in piracy whether they're ever obliged to engage in piracy, and if so, on either side, when, when are they uh, either obliged to pirate or not to pirate? And there are two common theories that you will see a, a lot in discussions about piracy and ethics. The first theory is that piracy is theft, and this is the usual theory promoted by Hollywood and the major record labels and the other, the other copyright industries, and some other people who are persuaded by their arguments. Piracy and theft are essentially morally equivalent. Second theory that you might find to be more common amongst uh, certain circles, perhaps at hacker conferences um, or people who use peer-to-peer -peer networks, is that piracy is awesome. This is really great. We get all this free music and uh, free movies. And sometimes, perhaps, Hollywood accidentally promotes the same theory uh, by selling you the message that uh, if you become a pirate, you get to make out with people who are really hot. Um, but more seriously, many people who, most people who advocate this kind of idea say, yeah, look, let's just dance on the graves of the, uh, the, the MPAA or the RAA, and perhaps we can dance on their graves to new independent music that will still be produced even if there is an enormous amount of piracy in the future. Now, tonight I want to convince you in, in the course of this talk that both of these theories are wrong. Actually, uh, the reality is more complicated than piracy just being awesome and we should go out and do it. Uh, and we should be looking for a better and more sophisticated theory of piracy. Now, Another observation you will sometimes encounter if you ask people who, who download files whether their actions are ethical, some people will say, well, yeah, I download music, but if I really like it, I'll go out and buy it. Or I download music, but I make sure I go to concerts, so I pay artists that way. Or I pirate music, but I only pirate from the big companies, the big record labels, the big film studios. If it's independent music, I'm, I'll be sure to go and buy it. So I think this constellation of, of more subtle theories is interesting and deserves to be studied more closely. But before I get into that, I need to ask a kind of meta question, which is, if we're going to talk about whether something's good or bad, uh, how can we do that? And there's an entire branch of philosophy that studies these kinds of questions, whether certain acts are good or bad. Um, and they involve theories of ethics that say uh, they have some notion of what's good in the world, uh, and what's bad, and then some notion of what, which actions by human beings are right and which actions are wrong. And there's some connection between these two things, but it varies with the theory. So, for example, a traditional theory of ethics is, well, you can do what you like so long as you don't disobey the rules in the Bible. The Bible, you know, gives us injunctions to conduct, and if we follow those, then we're free to do anything else, and that's ethical. 
uh, a more modern theory is what I like to call the kind of score maximizing theory, utilitarianism. We have happiness. Every person in society has some level of happiness. And you add all of those levels of happiness together, and that's how good the world is. So if more people are happy, that's, that's good or better. And then the actions that are right are those which maximize uh, the total happiness in the world. A variant of this theory called rule utilitarianism says, well, no, no, let's not take actions that maximize happiness. That's way too hard. Let's find some rules that maximize happiness, and then everyone should be required to follow those rules. The right thing to do is to follow the utilitarian rule. Uh, a stricter uh, theory of ethics that's taught to people in, in law schools, for instance, is that you can do whatever you like, provided you don't disobey the law. So the law is a set of rules. Don't break those. You can behave however you like after that. Uh, you can do justice consequentialism, where before I had utilitarianism, which had the idea of maximizing happiness over the world. There are other theories that are similarly based on the consequences of actions, but instead of maximizing happiness, maybe they want to maximize fairness. Uh, but that's tricky because it's not always clear what kind of fairness we're talking about. Uh, if you go out and ask people, is, is one thing fair or is another thing fair, you'll get answers that tend to say, well, it's f rewards are fair if they were earned. And if they're not earned, then they're, they're not good. So, if I walk, the problem with this theory is that if I walk through a forest and find a peach tree and find a delicious peach and I enjoy it, that doesn't count for anything uh, in this kind of idea of fairness because I didn't earn the peach tree. And, and it, it, this theory is subject to other similar criticisms. Um, there are other fancy theories of fairness that you can dig up in philosophy textbooks. Uh, John Rawls is very famous for having his that involves maximizing the rights and liberties of the worst off people in society. And that's very different to the intuition about fairness that most people have. But the point here isn't to d dig too deeply into any of these theories because that, that's what philosophy classes are for. It's just to point out, well, there are lots of these theories and they disagree with each other. And in order to, to give a talk tonight about this subject meaningfully, I'm going to have to pick one. And I'm just going to pick one theory of, of uh, ethics that I really like and which I think is also quite geeky. So hopefully this audience will, will tend to agree with it. Um, it's called decision procedure consequentialism and it sits somewhere in between uh, the two kinds of utilitarianism that I talked about before. Uh, so the goal, the good for society is adding everyone's welfare together, everyone's well-being together, and maximizing the score. But what's right is to follow a decision procedure or an algorithm that we think maximizes uh, that social well-being. And Well, how do we know what algorithm to use? Well, this is also part of the theory. It says, well, we shouldn't try to make up our own algorithm because it's too hard. It takes too much time and too much effort, and it's not productive for a billion people all to have their own algorithm for good behavior. We should be working on the question of algorithms for good behavior for, uh, collectively. It should be a research project that we work on. And in particular, you can apply this to a narrow space like piracy. Let's say, let's try and find an algorithm for good behavior uh, with respect to piracy. So in order to do that, we need to start off with asking the question of, well, what are the consequences of an act of piracy? If I decide to copy something without authorization, how do I understand the consequences for everyone else in the world from taking that action? And the consequences tend to depend on what the alternative was. So yes, I can pirate here, but what happens if I didn't pirate? An extreme example in favor of piracy we could, that would, I think, make almost ever, you know, anyone agree that in this narrow case, at least, piracy is the right thing to do. Imagine a student in a third world country who earns $2 a day, uh, and they're very bright and they're studying hard, and they want to get a textbook for some specialized field because they want to learn and study that field uh, so that perhaps they can get into a PhD program on the other side of the world or, or get a better paying job. Uh, but they just can't afford this at the moment. Um, and, and if they don't pirate the book, they simply won't have a copy of the book. I think most people would agree that in this narrow instance, it's ethical for that person to pirate the book. 
But that's not really the, the common case that we're talking about when we're talking about file sharing. More realistically, what we're talking about is Alice, who wants to download some entertainment thing, a movie or a book or a film or a piece of music, which will be fun and nice for her, but she doesn't really need it. Her career, her future is not at stake. And so here, if we ask what the alternative to piracy is, it turns out there are two possibilities, two worlds we might be living in. And it'll depend on who Alice is and which thing she's thinking about pirating as to whether we're in A world or B world. In A world, in the absence of the decision to pirate, she would go out and happily buy the thing. CD's $10, she thinks it'll be worth $30 to her, so she goes out and she buys it. Or in B world, perhaps the CD is $10 and she thinks, no, look, you know, it might be nice, but it's not really worth $10 to me. Maybe I'd pay five. Um, and so in the absence of piracy, she would not buy the CD. In that second case, I think the certain consequentialist theories say, well, piracy is a constructive thing to do. It makes Alice better off. She gets to enjoy the, the music. And it doesn't make anyone worse off because the alternative didn't have anyone gaining any benefit. So piracy maybe is arguably OK in that case. But if she was going to buy the album in the absence of piracy, well, that's a more murky situation. Uh, and if we look further into that murky situation, we see consequences. Um, if Alice pirates instead of buying, she's a little bit richer. She has $10 more than she would have had otherwise. And the publisher and, or the artist, on the other hand, is $10 poorer. So those look maybe like they cancel out, maybe. But there's a third consequence that is ethically very important. And that is that the incentive for future artists, or maybe this archer, artist in, at a future moment in time, to spend time and effort on, uh, on producing albums, or to quit their day job and stop, stop waiting tables at a cafe to go and produce music full time, the incentive or ability for the artist to do that is reduced. And that actually hurts Alice. With very small probability, it means there'll be some future album that she wants that won't exist because she didn't pay for the last one. But more importantly than that, Alice isn't only hurting herself. She's actually hurting everyone else in the world who likes the same music. Because that, in, that small probability event, one less album, hurts everyone. And this is why the ethics of piracy is tricky. Uh, this, this problem is called the tragedy of the commons, and if you go and ask economists and lawyers about copyright law, they'll tell you about this. But it's not always intuitive to us that it's occurring. So is it good for Alice to pirate if she would have purchased the album? Probably not. Uh, probably if she was willing to buy it, she should have bought it. So you might ask, well, if lawyers and economists know about this problem, why don't they write copyright laws that say it's OK for Alice to pirate when this problem isn't happening? And there's a, a political answer, which I think is the, the real answer, which is that copyright law is written by and for publishers. And so they're not too worried about the, the benefits of piracy for Alice. But there's also a, a theoretical reason why the law will have trouble capturing distinctions like this. And that is, you can't write a law for a judge to enforce which tells the judge how to look into Alice's heart and say, oh, I can see you were going to buy the album, so I'm going to say that this is copyright infringement. Or, no, I can see it was only worth $5 to you and the price was 10 so OK, go and pirate it. Um, the law can't do that. Uh, but perhaps, when we live in a kind of lawless world of piracy, Ethically, as individuals, we may be able to do that. And in some extreme cases, copyright laws do try to get at this problem a little bit. If you look at the American doctrine of fair use uh, or other kinds of limitations and exceptions that you'll find in European copyright laws, they, they capture a little bit of this, but not most of the benefit of piracy that I think makes the world's teenagers actually go out and copy things. So now I want to take this dilemma that Alice faces as a, a first draft algorithm, a first draft hypothesis about when piracy is ethical. And it would say, if you were going to buy the album for $10, then you should either not pirate it, go out and buy it, or if you did pirate it, you owe the artist some money. You need to go and pay the artist some, somehow or another. 
And then the second option, well, if you weren't going to buy the album, maybe it's okay to go and pirate it. Uh, maybe there's even some weak obligation to, because if we're utilitarians, we say, well, this is makes some people better off and, and nobody worse off, so it's definitely better. Now, there are some problems with this first draft theory. Firstly, how can we be you know, honest with ourselves and be sure that we know when we would have bought something or not? And then on the other side, what if the artist we're paying, buying an album from is Madonna? Or what if the so-called artist is actually a faceless record label that, that never pays any musicians any money at all? Let's look at these problems in turn. So the first one, how do we trust ourselves to, to make fair judgments about far-flung artists? Some artists on the other side of the world produce something and we tell ourselves, oh, you know, I don't, wanna, don't think I should need to pay them. And, and we just keep doing that over and over again and ultimately we, you know, we keep more money in our wallets but the, the, the world suffers uh, because of our actions. And I think this is a, how, knowing how to keep ourselves honest, or no, pirates knowing how to keep themselves honest, is a collective problem that, that people should engage in if they're serious about ethical conduct. Um, and perhaps they should be looking for heuristics about when suddenly you owe a debt to an artist, or what point you owe a debt to an artist. And maybe you should be talking about writing plugins for your media player to tell you, hey, you know, maybe you owe this artist some money. Um, you've been listening to their music a lot, and my records don't say you ever bought an album from them. Okay, so that's one question. On the other side, uh, Madonna is very rich, undoubtedly. Uh, and traditionally in utilitarianism, moving money from poor people to rich people is bad because the money is less useful to the rich people than it is to the poor people. Um, so does that mean that you should never ethically give money to Madonna for her music? You know, maybe that's the case under some ethical theories, but we need to be really careful if we're applying this kind of, re applying this kind of reasoning one, because it's kind of arguably selfish, but secondly, uh, perhaps Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails, you know, who receive a lot less criticism for their, their role in the, the world of music, are essentially the same as Madonna. Those artists are very wealthy, and if we really are serious about this, maybe we wouldn't be paying them either. Unless, I mean, unless we're giving them incentives to do disruptive things like, like Radiohead and Nine Inch Nails have done. Uh, Radiohead giving away its albums um, at whatever price you name, Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails getting in front of, up in front of his audiences and saying, hey, the, my albums are too expensive, you should pirate them. Um, and this leads to the major label question. Um, so some people might say, well, this record label or this film studio is, is evil, and so therefore I'm not going to pay money to them. Now, whether it's arguably at all true that certain record labels are aren't, like, kind of bad depends a lot on the details of the industry that you're talking about. And there are subtle things about record labels that make us think they're evil when, okay, maybe they do do bad things, but they're less bad than we think. Um, in order to understand how this works, you actually need to look into the accounting books of a modern record label, and what you see is they'll sign 10 bands, and out of those 10 bands, for each of them they'll spend a huge amount of money, traditionally about a million dollars, on video clips and advertising and shopping malls all over the United States, um, and limousines and caviar, um, in order to produce their first album. Ten, that's a million dollars that the record label has spent. Um, so 10 million dollars in total across the, nine, uh, across the 10 bands. And then nine of those 10 bands will lose money. They won't ever make back a million dollars. So. The tenth band makes money, but the tenth band never gets paid under their contract because all the money that they earned gets taken out and used to pay for the other nine bands that were not profitable. So it's possible for a record label to be screwing its artists and making a loss at the same time, which is counterintuitive. And maybe, maybe our objections to this kind of system are something to do with the way that music gets promoted in shopping malls rather than about the business structure or about the kind of music it is. Um, and so before we sort of say, let's, let's outright condemn record labels, we have to sort of think, well, do, we, do, you, know, do you really not like glitzy top 40 music? Um, maybe there are some people who say, yeah, I, I, I listen to top 40 music because it gets stuck in my head and I want to pirate it, but I really wish it didn't exist and there was no such, more such music in the world. And for those people, okay, 
uh, it's ethical to go and pirate stuff. But for the rest of us, we need to think more closely about this question, I think. Anyway, just gathering all the stuff I've said, there's a second draft of a, an algorithm, for music at least, here. So let's, let's talk through how it would work. Start with one album that you purchased and you really liked. It was considered a good purchase. It gives you a, a way to value how much you care about music. Um, and then you look up that album in your iTunes playlist and you say, okay, how many times did I listen, how many times did I listen to that album? And that gives you a value per listen for you, subjectively. And then you can go through the rest of your music collection and infer a value for everything else um, that you've got in there. And that gives you a kind of notional debt to each artist. Then you subtract from each artist set the amount you spend on t-shirts and concert tickets and CDs. And then you get a leftover debt. Um, perhaps you want to permute this process for how wealthy the artists are. If you really think that money should go to uh, small bands instead of Madonna, OK, take, take some of the, the money and, and rearrange it based on uh, research about the contracts that these artists have and how wealthy they are. Maybe in that extreme case where you really don't like top 40 music and want to kill it, but you still want to listen to it, OK, permute for that if you really want to. And then at the end, let's have a piece of software that pops up and says, oh, hey, you know, I, I see you've been listening to a lot of this stuff. Maybe it's time you paid uh, some money to that artist. So I think this, this theory is compatible, or this, this proposal or, or, or algorithm is compatible with a bunch of those ethical theories I talked about before. Um, all the utilitarian ones, some of the justice-based ones, not the, the justice-based theory that says only rewards that are earned are fair, because that justice theory says that piracy is never ethical. You never earned something you pirated. You never paid for it, so you shouldn't pirate it. And it's clearly not, not compatible with strict law abiding theories that, that don't have room for civil disobedience. If we think we have broken laws and we can't change them because the political process is so entrenched, um, if we think despite that that we should, should still obey the law, then absolutely piracy should be forbidden. But clearly we live in a world where that's not the view of a large percentage of the population. And so I suppose that's my audience for this argument. So in conclusion, this second draft algorithm is really just a draft. And I expect it to contain bugs uh, that people would, be, would find and, and shake out. And I guess part of my argument was that this should be a, a collective project that perhaps uh, the peer-to-peer -peer and hacker community should be interested in. Um, and, but it also seems like a necessary effort um, in a world where we have laws that say do not pirate and, and facts that say 50% of the population pirates on a regular basis. And when we have that massive divergence, well, I think research is needed on, on this question of how to behave uh, in the space in between. Um, so that's my argument. I hope there are some questions or criticisms I can get from you guys. Uh, I think there's a microphone in the middle there. Uh, and you could queue up and uh, no one steal a spot in the queue from anyone else. Yeah, um, I guess the uh, big problem I have with your theory, or at least the one you went into, is in the beginning you said uh, we should work on this together, we shouldn't have our own personal ideas. Uh, this is wrong to me in every level. I mean, I agree we should all work on it together. We should all agree what we individually, what, what we collectively think is right. But if you say we shouldn't have our own personal ethics, then you're entering a very dangerous area. I think everyone should always be uh, thinking about their ethics and thinking about the collective ethics. Because so that, that's actually a really good point, and I, perhaps I didn't. Ex I actually didn't explain this in, in sufficient detail uh, on the way through. One of the criticisms of act utilitarianism, which is the traditional version, which says, you know, Alice, you should do whatever makes the people in the world as well off as as, as possible, as happy as possible. I want you to maximize society's well-being for every action that you take. The problem there is that she doesn't know the consequences of most of her actions. And so if she really tried to follow that theory naively, uh, she would spend all of her day sitting there worrying about the consequences of actions. And that would be self-defeating, because she would never do anything. She would never make the people around her happy, uh, because she'd be sitting there worrying about ethics all the time. Um, so the argument isn't that we shouldn't individually think about these questions. 
but that we should trade off um, idealized theories with practical ways of living our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And the same thing, I think, applies to whether you, you talk about this as a collective research project or as an individual kind of thing that we should think about. Uh, you should do both, but you shouldn't have everyone necessarily re repeating the, uh, the thinking of, of that's done by everyone around them. Let's try and share our conclusions and also have some room for indi individual variation on, on what constitutes ethical behavior. Um, and maybe the ideal algorithms should have inputs, like do you like top 40 music? If yes, then go to 10. If, if no, then go to 30. Um, yes? Hello, Peter. I'm Jeremy Zimmerman from uh, La Quadrature du Net. Um, I have to say that I mostly agree with your analysis, um, apart from the fact that I tend to hate the, the word piracy and prefer to use the word sharing because it's mostly about sharing. And when you share, you, you give as much as you, as you take. And I think it's, it's important. Um, I totally agree with the objective of funding creation, which is something essential today. But I think there, there are two points we might take into consideration. It's no clear answer, but maybe trails for, for reflection. Uh, first of all is what the economists uh, call the externalities, mm -hmm. which are the unintended consequence of a transaction. Uh, one negative externality typically is pollution. So th there are positive externalities, which are uh, when you love somebody, when somebody is loved, then money will flow in some way. And um, I think this perfectly suits the, uh, the, the, the change of paradigm that, that is not admitted by the publishers who write the laws right now. They want to preserve their, their old model that is based on scarcity. And with sharing and digital technologies and internet, we're moving to an era of uh, an economics of abundance. And in this economics of abundance, the real value lies in attention. What you, what you like, what you look for, is something that, that has value. So I think we shall look in, in this direction. And the other very shorter lead is that we have already mutualized schemes for funding creation that doesn't rely on everyone making choices. I think of the digital um, private copy, fair use copy, uh, uh -huh. Levi, that is of course not perfect and which ratios are opaque and etc. we shall review them. But we already have such means of funding collectively creation that we might uh, think about. So Jeremy made a whole lot of important points all at once, uh, which I agree with, I think, all of them. So I'm just going to try and talk through all of them. As for, to uh, for talking about sharing, I absolutely agree. I think, I, in a sense, I chose the word piracy because I want to be a bit controversial to this audience. and and explore the idea that in this intermediate period where we don't really have uh, an, you know, an equilibrium in our uh, copyright system and our digital economy, that we may face some ethical obligations even during this kind of transitional period. Um, and I also want to use the word piracy because I think insofar as it's been besmirched, we should be clear that it, we can reclaim it and that it has positive consequences. And I want to keep showing you this picture of Johnny Depp, but it's buried somewhere in my talk. Um, here we go. Um, on externalities, I can't leave that there. It's too distracting for you. Um, on externalities, I absolutely agree. And the negative externality that I talked about, that, that way that Alice is copying hurts other listeners, um, is a negative externality and it's in the algorithm. There are also positive externalities to sharing, absolutely. If I can, um, if I can give something to my friends, share, give playlists to my friends, then that's great for them. And it's also great for the artists because new people will hear their work and go to see their concerts. And that needs to be factored in. I mean, I've got only a very rough draft of this, this idea that I'm floating. And then on the last point about alternative solutions, alternative policy solutions, I completely agree with you. So I, 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 my PhD was on private copying levies as an alternative to copyright. And the problem that I see at the moment is that we haven't actually gotten, I mean, maybe we're getting close with the, the German Social Democratic Party adding a flat rate to their, their policy platform. Maybe we will see in the future uh, a world where we have a sensible copyright system that doesn't require us to go off and think about 
our own ethics every time we do something. Maybe the, the rules will be sensible in the future, and we should fight for that. But perhaps one way of fighting, I, I think the most effective reason, the reason that those options are on the table is because of civil disobedience. Um, people pirating stuff for the last 10 years. Um, and I also think, you know, at the same time, we should think about that piratical action as a conscious political act, and part of thinking about it as a conscious political act is also being mindful of its negative side effects and mitigating those. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I agree with all of those points. Yeah, next. <clears throat> it seems to me that you're making the classic mistake that all economists make, which is to assume perfect information that is available at no cost, so that we all know how good something is. Well, actually, I can afford 99 cents for an iTunes song or five euros for, for a cheap movie or whatever. But what really sucks is if you buy the, the movie for five euros and then after two minutes it turns out it's a turd. And you don't, get, you don't get your money for the other 86 minutes back. So what I seem to be reading in your uh, proposal is that we should actually you not know, pay for buying something and then play it however often you want, but you should, we should uh, pay to play. So you should uh, play a song more often or you watch the whole movie, you pay more. If you don't watch or don't listen, you pay less. I, I don't really mean it in that strict and precise sense. If you actually followed this algorithm, I think you, you would see that, I mean, if you followed it slavishly, and I'm really not suggesting that we should be following it slavishly, but uh, if you followed it, I think you would see the difference appear between um, things that you really like and enjoy for a long time um, and things that you listen to once and then didn't enjoy. Um, and, and this is because the payments are lower down in, in this flow than the, um, the data about how often you listen to this. And this is actually a benefit not only of this kind of anarchic proposal for ethical conduct, it's also a benefit of, of collective licensing schemes because they could base the payments on data about who listens to what. And what you're talking about is a problem with the existing music market where you have to decide, do I want to pay one euro or five euros now before you've listened to the song properly? Really, you don't know how much it's worth to you until you've had it for 10 years. I mean, that's... Right. So if you keep paying every time you, you watch it or listen to it, then, then that would more or less fit with your algorithm. <laughs> You would still have to start paying immediately rather than decide later. That's but a good criticism. We should find a perm permutation of the algorithm that avoids the problem. There's two interesting consequences to that. The first one is that if you do that, then it actually makes a lot more sense to start making really good stuff rather than just polish up the turds like, people, like they do now. But the second is that we really need some kind of DRM or some other invasive technology to do all the accounting and everything. And then the whole issue with abandoned works, something that is out of print, that, they, that, that the DRM servers are turned off or that they won't print anymore, that I can't get anymore because okay, the... Okay, two things really quickly and then we'll move on to the next question. Right. So I agree with you about the, uh, about the first point. I have a beautiful data set that you should come and look at after the talk, showing which artists would get more money and which less under the, the world you're talking about. And secondly, I want to be clear that I was not suggesting any kind of DRM. If you want to collect this data and then act on it, it should just be something that you do in private on your computer and no one else ever sees the data. Um, I'm not suggesting that we should have any technology that, that gives this data to anybody else or centralizes it. Uh, next. Hello, Peter. Um, you talked a bit about the blockbuster business model you know, where you have 10 artists and nine of them are going to die horribly. So, of course, they end up almost always completely bankrupt and they end up owing the millions of dollars to the record label. Then the one band that gets successful breaks even. And I was wondering if you could talk more about the, not just in this algorithm, you can permute for your, your ideology of production. A key thing there is affirmatively punishing that business model because that's what really hurts artists and I believe that um, if you love music you must pirate to help destroy that business model. So, so 
Can you help us quantify? Maybe not pirate from maybe not pirate from really small bands that are just starting out because yeah, we need yeah. to, to help them to in order to destroy the old business model. Now, I actually think you're right, and I, I have there is a theory about where this comes from. Insofar as it, it, this subject is uh, capable of being theorized, um, and the theory is about what are called network externalities. Now, network externalities is something I should be able to explain to you guys in technical terms first. Imagine that there are not one kind of telephone, but two kinds of telephones. And the two kinds of telephones will never talk to each other. Um, now, how useful each of these two kinds of telephones are is determined not primarily by how good the the phone algorithm, you know, the phone standard is, but by how, by how many other people are using that phone standard. If you can call anyone in the world using a particular kind of telephone, it doesn't matter that there's another better telephone somewhere else. The worst telephone is more useful because of this network externality, this network of people who um, give you benefit because they use a certain kind of telephone, thereby enabling you to call them. Um, and the same thing, arguably, is true of you know, QWERTY keyboards versus um, Dvorak keyboards. Uh, it's true of file formats like Microsoft Word versus you know, Abbey Word or some other file format. Um, and the same, less intuitively, I'm going to argue, is true about culture. Um, the value of watching or listening to or reading a particular piece of culture is partly dependent on the true merit, how good that book is, how enjoyable that piece of music is. It's also partly dependent on how many other people have listened to or watched or read it. Um, and just think about it this way. If you are going out to buy a fantasy novel and you see on the shelf, OK, here's Harry Potter and here's some other fantasy novel, and I expect them to be equally good in terms of enjoyment that I get from the book. But I know that if I read the Harry Potter novel, I'll be able to understand all those dinner table conversations that everyone was having about Harry Potter. So I'm going to buy the Harry Potter novel, and it's more valuable to me, independent of its quality, because other people are listening to it or watching it or reading it. Uh, and that, I think, is one of the reasons why we have this winner-takes-all model of popular culture. Now, I don't think that we can completely eliminate this winner-takes-all phenomenon. I think the fact that it's better to have read the same books as the other people at your dinner table means that naturally, sometimes, certain kinds of things will become very popular. But what I do think we can do is to level the playing field so that you don't have huge amounts of money being invested in marketing, determining which things become uh, the next big wave. And maybe that's where we need to change incentives so that uh, we gave less money to the people who market Harry Potter like crazy and more money to the other fantasy novel that could have been Harry Potter. So I, I agree with your conclusion. I think there's a mechanism there. Next. Uh, yeah, um, I was wondering, what is uh, the product of a musician? Is it the CDs they uh, produce, or is it uh, uh, a concert that they are playing at? Uh, I believe uh, that um, the CD is a, a promotional thing uh, to um, make me go uh, watch the, the band at the concert. So why pay for promotion? Why not uh, just, well, here's the music, listen to it, and well, if you like it, go to a concert, because uh, that is the real, that, the real work. So I think that's actually what's e exactly what's happened to music in particular. And it's a, it's a complicating thing about music that actually means that you could probably live in a world with no music copyright and, and never call piracy bad. And if all you had was a music production problem, uh, you'd be fine. Where this gets trickier is with books and m films. Uh, yes, if you're an author, you can go and give readings and speeches about your book. But it's pretty hard to see how authors will ever make a living uh, from doing that. It really seems like the core of what an author is producing is the actual text that people actually read. Um, and the same is arguably true of, of films, although perhaps you could, you could try to draw a distinction between a DVD that you watch at home and a film that you go and see in a theater. And the, 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 the theater experience is richer, and you can continue to pay for that and then have free downloads of things afterwards. But 
I think, I think, so I think I agree with you, but I think music is unusual in the sense that artists do have this other uh, really good way of making money. And it's only most of them who, are, who have that option. If you're really a poor performer, you just want to sit here with your laptop and play electronic music, and I'm just going to you know, be really nerdy and play my music here, it's going to be hard for me to produce a good concert experience, but I might produce really awesome recordings that people uh, enjoy. And so maybe there are some corner cases there where we really still need to have this concern about music too. Hello, Peter. Um, I have a question about this algorithm. Uh, the way you present it is uh, very one-sided, uh, a very short uh, fact check. Um, research repeatedly shows that an album has about two to three songs that people usually want to pay money to listen to, normally, on average. Ten years ago, this would mean you have to buy a $20 CD uh, with tax, let's say, seven bucks a song. Today, this is about one, one and a half dollars a song, so five times or more less expensive. And all the record companies are still around. So to me, this looks like this is optional profit, which they can do without. So why should I engage into an optional expense for their optional profit? Where is the ethic meeting in the middle? I think the album is probably dead. I think you can do this. I mean, you should just think about this in terms of songs, probably, instead of albums. And I think the, the music industry is realizing that. You know, once every few years, someone's going to try to produce a great concept album, like, you know, the Pink Floyd or uh, um, Lou Reed albums of the 70s, and, and try and make an album that has a story, and that's a thing that really hangs together. But the truth is, you know, this algorithm doesn't need to have albums in it, and music sales arguably don't really need to have albums in them anymore. I mean, it'll be probably more true in, in five or ten years than it is right now, where you still see them being put out and you still see physical sales. I think that's going to go away. So, uh, just a short follow-up. So, you think that the reason that people still, uh, the bands still produce stuff in albums is to drive CD sales, not that the new market actually requires this? I mean, I don't want to put it in exactly those words. I think that's part of the decision-making process that, that goes on inside a um, inside a record label. I think tradition is a big part of it for, for artists. If you were a new band starting out, would you, would you want to just set, put out each song one by one, or would you want to try and make an album? Like may, Maybe you grew up listening to albums, so you make albums. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm thinking this is um, a discussion that we probably need to have like in the greater society, uh, not just um, among 500 hackers uh, on a field in Holland. Um, do you have any indication that the uh, opposing side, uh, so to speak, or would be interested in having this discussion? Or do we have to wait for the whole copyright system to collapse before anything is gets done? Um, I don't think, I mean, I, look, I think it's a, a useful conversation to have. Um, I mean, this side of the conversation is useful to have amongst hackers, but also amongst the wider society in which 50% of the population uh, actually goes out and uses peer-to-peer -peer networks all the time to, to download stuff. I think those are the people I want to make this argument to. I guess if I'm arguing, like, if you're in a policy world, this kind of stuff is too intangible. You can't say, hey, we should encourage people to beha behave ethically because I think that's a hard sell in a policy world. And I I'm with Jeremy. If, if we're talking to policymakers, we should be talking about alternative systems of, of laws that make more sense, like uh, uh, global licenses in France or flat rates in Germany or voluntary collective licenses in the United States. I think. Uh, if, you, if you're in a policy world, you've got to speak a different policy kind of language. And talking about theories of ethics amongst the policy people isn't necessarily going to fly. Um, I wonder how your ethics will um, hold up against the reality check. Like, if I make music today, I would probably like to see, um, like, most of the profit coming in over the next half year so that I can pay back the banks. And um, 
On the other hand, if I now make something that is super awesome and people in 20 years will still uh, listen to and I'm still getting money in 20 years, why would I ever make something new? I would just um, not put out anything new because the people would um, continue to listen and continue paying for the same thing. I think that's true of great music under any scheme in which there is payment for great music or great films or great books. Um, and you can talk about ideas like limited terms, um, saying, well, you know, after 10 years or 20 years, um, okay, you've been paid for, your, for the fact that you produced a great thing and now let's, um, let's remove that, that uh, artist either from the copyright system or from the remuneration pool of a collective license or um, from the algorithm in this crazy ethical theory that I was just bouncing around. And the money will go instead to new fans who are trying to produce a new great thing. Um, and in some of those cases, I don't think it makes a big difference. In others, yes, maybe it does make a big difference. And you know, I'm, I, I guess I, I don't have a strong opinion about which way to go. I think copyright terms are way too long and we need to shorten them. But a large part of the reason why we need to shorten them is because they inhibit uh, the creative reuse and, and access to these, um, these great works after, even after 50 or 100 years uh, from the date of production. I think we need to get that roadblock out of the way. But that's the main problem with, with term length. I don't have a strong opinion about whether artists should still be paid you know, a, a, a pension in royalties for great stuff they produced back in the 60s. You know? OK. Um, there's another argument that. Um, Copyright might actually be a good thing if it is used to protect uh, free software. Um, it could actually be bad for free software if uh, copyright expired after a couple years because then companies could steal um, the, uh, the source and not contribute back to uh, the community or not be forced to contribute back. And I wonder, um, do you have any thoughts on that? So that's a common argument about copyright law and free software. Um, I think it's, it doesn't seem to be, my, I don't think my talk tonight is at all relevant to that, um, that concern. Uh, I wasn't talking about software copyright at all anyway, and I, I think there are certain things about software that make it different from uh, music and writing and film, uh, and certain benefits to having software freedom that are kind of more profound, perhaps, than um, uh, the ability to remix other people's music, which is important, but uh, you know, software is much, much better if you can see inside it. Um, so yeah, just I, I, you know, you should come and talk to me later about that, and I, I can I can say a bit more about it. But it's not really, um, yeah. Don't take anything in my talk to pertain to software. Well, be before Next. before I go into my question, actually, I think it's uh, a shame that we're talking about copyright specifically about music because I don't see why musical artists should be treated any differently than any other copyrighted uh, medium. But to, to to come to the comment I wanted to make, uh, the Belgian Sabam, which is pretty much the uh, the same as Ria, but uh, but in Belgium, made two decisions recently. One is to remind daycare centers that they need to pay for the music that they, pay for, that they play for toddlers. And the second is that they increase the rates uh, for schools uh, for the music that they play for uh, ch kindergarten and, and lower school uh, kids. Now, uh, this is uh, commercial products that they're playing for small children influence, uh, with uh, highly influential minds. They come home asking to buy the CDs for the music that they heard in the classrooms. So these people are actually asking for more money for commercially pushing their music on small children. Now a group of us have actually started uh, combining um, old folk songs, 200 year old folk songs for which copyright has expired, playing them with amateur magicians, putting them on CDs and distributing them to uh, schools and daycare centers to try to, uh, to, to, to contract this. Now, I think the ethics of piracy are not what is in question here. I think the question is the ethics of the music industry. I, to I, mean, I totally agree with you. I think it's awesome that you're fighting back against that. And I don't think that uh, there's any excuse for that kind of behavior by collecting societies. Uh, you know, I think it's just 
a very simple story of economic selfishness on their part. You know, they, they get to take a percentage of this stream of money, and so they're always going to go around and try and make that stream bigger. Uh, I don't think there's any excuse for it. Uh, I don't remember when was the last time I paid uh, for watching a movie or paid for a book I read. So I just wonder, can you estimate what fraction of costs uh, is in the distribution and delivery of movies uh, if, if uh, one purchases legitim legitimately and the same for books? And what fraction of cost uh, is the actual compensation of creating the movie or the book? Perhaps yeah, I should, can you say uh, the last bit again? Yes? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch the second. You said what percentage of cost is the uh, distribution? Yes, so typically one, one waits until the movie is available on discs or a book is released as a paperback. What fraction of the cost uh, in a paperback or in a disc uh, is, uh, goes to the creator or the studio or the writer and uh, editor? And what fraction is for distribution of the stuff and printing kit and delivery of physical products? So the traditional answer to this for CDs was that in the United States it cost about 5 to $7 uh, to put a CD into a shop and sell it to someone, which was about half the cost of a CD. Um, with books, I think the cost, the best way to infer that cost is to look for classics editions of public domain books because those are completely competitive and there's basically no royalties to any publisher or, you know, very small ro like returns to the publisher and no royalties to any author on those public domain books and you, you'll, you'll see um, those prices in whichever country you're in, in a bookshop and they'll be, you know, in the United States maybe four or five dollars to get a book onto a shelf in a bookshelf, in a bookshop. Um, and then if you want to know, th th so then the rest goes mostly to publishers if you're talking about the music industry. Um, no, 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 no music, movies. Maybe, sorry? Movies only, documentaries, uh, fiction movies, no music industry. I don't listen to music. So with, with films. Films. And so books, so book, as I said, it, with books, I think it's about five dollars to get a book into a bookshop on the shelf, um, and so the rest goes usually with books about fifty-fifty to the publisher and the author. Um, with m films, um, the cost of a DVD, I'm actually not sure. I don't know if anyone else can answer that question, but I can't with a DVD. Hi. Um, I see one big um, issue with uh, the system you propose is obviously um, uh, a sense of fairness that's being involved or uh, applied to uh, the pirates. But I think that a lot of uh, people who pirate music and films uh, validate their behavior also by um, the ethics or behavior that is coming from the music and film industry in the way they are distributing music and uh, processing pirates and other... Uh, sorry, can you speak uh, oh, closer into the yeah. microphone? I think that, well, you uh, propose a, a system of fairness uh, on part of the pirate side, so to speak, but also that a lot of people validate their pirating, uh, mostly because um, the way the music and record industry and the film industry is behaving in the way of uh, distributing content and... Uh, following up on people who breach that uh, issue. And obviously it's a very mature system, but uh, I see a very um, big issue in implementing it because I don't think a lot of people would be up for it by the way uh, the positions between the two sides, as someone just said, uh, are right now. Um, so I didn't, I, I'm not sure whether I caught that correctly, but I was wondering, I think you might have been saying, well, aren't people justifying their piratical actions with respect to these existing industries as they currently stand. Yes. Is that right? Um, and so that's right. And I actually think that that's a valid reason for people to say, well, look, I'm fed up with the way that these industries are behaving and I'm going to uh, pirate their stuff because, I, you know, I want to see some alternative version of this industry appear in its place. Um, and, you know, I think that's a coherent um, position to take provided that you remember that you should then be sure to reward the, the artists and the publishing companies that are doing things differently. Um, 
So, you know, that's, that's a, a pretty valid way to approach the question. Uh, Nils Helgaard Larsen from uh, IT Political Association of Denmark. You a few times mentioned flat rate uh, as a solution. I see it as a problem uh, because if it's a legally enforced uh, flat rate, eventually it, it will end up as some extra tax on my internet connections. Uh, and that will certainly not increase my happiness. Uh, I don't use their products, so I don't want to pay for them. Uh, that's a great question, and I, I actually think it's a whole other hour-long talk to talk about flat rates and all the benefits they have and all the problems they have and whether you can design them in such a way that they don't, that to maximize the benefits and minimize the problems, um, and whether they're a good idea from a, you know, a political perspective, whether we should be arguing for them. You know, I think the answer is probably yes, but I also think there are serious um, dangers with just rushing towards them without being careful and you need to make sure you don't build the wrong flat rate system um, that just pays more of the same big artists and, and doesn't pay the small artists, for instance. In terms of fairness, I think your concern, you said, well, why should I pay a flat rate when I don't listen to, I don't read many books online or I don't listen to much music? You know, the answer is, well, if you, if you consume some culture, then uh, uh, you are at least getting, you know, some benefit from some part of the system. Um, and this is inherently a problem with all of the projects we have in our societies that involve governments or, or collective action at all. You know, I pay taxes for um, the education of, of kids even if I don't have children myself, or I, you know, pay for health care even if I don't get sick. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's bad to have a publicly funded education system. I, I have a fine, oh, sorry. You want a tax for education, for entertainment? So, I, I didn't catch up. You should come and talk to me afterwards if you still have. Okay, I have a final uh, question to, uh, to the ethics. Okay, uh, last question. Okay, um, while we are in Holland, we have a beautiful law that means home copy that says that we can do a home copy on um, wherever the, the, uh, the source is legal or not. And therefore, we pay for our Blanco media. We play for, uh, yeah, there's not yet now a discussion to, play, uh, to pay for tax for the MP3 players and so. So, if you think we pay three times for the same song for the MP3 player to listen to it, to burn to the CD for in the car or our legal data, and for the song itself, what do you think about then ethics from privacy? So I think, I think that private copying levies, the systems, the, the question was about private copying taxes that, that exist in a, a number of European countries where you have a tax on your blank CDs um, and you pay the tax regardless of whether, um, you know, you use a blank CD for copying music or for something else. Um, I think the answer is that if those levies are going to continue to exist, we should argue that they give people the right to file share and they should, be, they should include that right. Um, as part of the bargain, you pay a tax, um, so you get the right to file share, and that's part of the the uh, flat rate or collective licensing solution that that I think is the right one ultimately. Um, if you wanted to deal with it in the terms of this algorithm that I'm talking about, again, a, you know, a crazy idea for individual behavior at this point in history. Um, in that line where it says T-shirts, concert tickets, CDs, and you're paying money you should count the private copying levies and, and include them as money already paid. And if you've already paid enough to, to an artist through the private copying levies, then you, maybe you don't owe them anymore. Agree. Thanks, everyone.